So in your mind, what was, uh, what is, was, is, continues to be uh, George's genius, unique presence, why he's been able to be the ringleader of this whole thing? Well, George, he reads a lot. And you know those crazy, those things that sound crazy to you that he says in these records? You know, there's, you know, there's a book behind that somewhere that he's read, you know, Pinocchio Theory, all of that stuff. You know, he's, and he's really good at harmonies. You know, Bernie was basically his, his, the musical half of his brain. Bernie could interpret anything he did and to make, and make music out of it. Whereas George was basically lyricist, you know, and like those harmonies, you know, they're very complex. I, you know, it, you know, a lot of people, basically jazz dudes, you know, they can't, they can't grasp the complexity of what we do until they try to do it, you know. That's like, like oh my goodness, you know, that's just, that's not just a three-finger chord, you know, there's some, some meat behind that. You know, you got the vir virtuosity of Bernie Worrell, you know, he's taking off back there. You know, you got Gary, you got Eddie, Come on, man. You, you ever listen to an Eddie Hazel solo? You know, that's that's otherworldly. But, you know, dudes, you know, they, they confuse the visual with the, you know, the bones of it, which is the music. You know, the music speaks for itself. But you can't hear it until you attempt to play it. And it's like, oh, man, this is crazy. I'll tell you, somebody sat in with us. I'm not going to say who because I don't want to embarrass him. Big jazz dude. Big jazz dude, right? So he sits in with us, and he was like a deer in headlights. He didn't know what to do. Say, so, yeah, you know, it sounds, even I thought that when I got in the band. I, you know, I'm like, because I'm looking, from my perspective, it looks like utter chaos. But if you, you know, I heard a, a, a a playback of it. I was like, man, that is beautiful. That was us. Because I'm, I was caught up in the visuals of it. I'm like, it's, you know, this running head, okay, this guitar player over here, this one over there, you know, it's just a mess. But the sound of it is completely different. And then I, at that point, that's when I, I could understand what the audience saw and heard. Not, you know, I'm cynical. You know, to me, you know, me standing up on the stage playing is no different than a dude at the post office pl punching a clock. It's the same thing. You know, I'm standing in a spot I have to stand in to get paid. And he does what he does to get paid. So I'm cynical in that respect. I can't see the art of it. You know, I can only feel it within what I'm doing. You know, so it's a job until I really sat down and listened to playbacks of what we did. Even records, I, you know, okay. Yeah, it's funky. I like it. It's funky, but I never explored the depth of it until much later in my career. Like when I catch flights now, I'll have, have days when I listen to only Glenn Goins stuff or only Gary Scheider stuff. You know, you know I want to say dominant. Gary Scheider dominant. Glenn Goins dominant. Boogie dominant. You know, and I have a now I have a full appreciation of what we did it, where I didn't when I was younger. It's just a bunch of crazy fools, you know, having fun, playing some music. OK, on to the next joint. But now that I listen back to it, you know, it's, it was it was magic. You know what I'm saying? I Feel definitely magic. understand. Yeah. That's the question, magic. That's interesting. Yeah. That you, like at the heart of it and weren't mm -hmm. fully cognizant of the magnitude no. of it at the time. No, absolutely not. Too wow. young. You know, young people tend to be stupid. <laughs> and I am certainly no different. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I'm not exempt from the stupidity of youth. <laughs> and so I think I think yeah. uh, I think Skeet, the thing with the jazz guys is I mean jazz just tends to be so much more like intellectual. And funk is all feel, man. You got to have yep. that feel. 
Oh, I realize that. Yeah, they, yeah. you know, they, they they adhere to a script, whatever that script may be. I mean, they have their periods of improvisation, but by and large, there's a script. There's a beginning. There's a middle. There's an end. Funk is not like that. Funk is like their elements of you know that you recognize but by and large you know it's not scripted you know you can you can hear what you want to hear in it so what do you tell somebody who maybe wants to play funk bass what do they what do they need to master well see to even ask that question if somebody a bass player asked me that question it's already too late you know you you have to feel that you know you can't you know, it's not a question of what do I do? You know, it's how do I feel when I, you know, when I hear that this dude play this, you know, how does that make me feel and how do I react to it? You know, you can't, it's, it's not really teachable. You know, Russ, you know, Russ Ferrante, right? We had a conversation about that one time. He said, that's not in the book anywhere, is it? I said, no. No, and at that point, while well, I was playing with Maceo at that point, I, I said, no, man, it's, that's 30 years of, you know, getting in the trenches and, and digging your way out of it. That's. Yeah. A lot, a lot of times, uh, a lot of discussions online, they talk about whether all funk has to be on the one or not. Can you I, speak to that I, a little bit? I very, rarely, I very rarely play on the one. I play behind the beat a lot, which is, you know, that's part of my style. I play on the beat, off the beat, and I try not to play what common folk would call the root. If a song is in E, I try not to play the e in E so much. You know, there's a lot of notes in there, you know, so you got to kind of feel, get, get around in those, in the, in the guts of whatever chord is being played. You know, if I play the one, it's going to be that note, whatever the, you know, whatever key the song is at. So, you know, boom, if, if it's E, I'm playing that E. But in, in the groove of the song, I'm not playing that E. I'm trying not to play that E. And that's, you know, I like to think that's what makes me unique in what I do. So when you took that uh, sabbatical, uh, in the mm -hmm. late seventies, was part of that because of all the drugs that was going on too, and I mean, I heard so many well, stories about that. Well, me personally, I've never done drugs ever. No drinks, no drugs, no cigarettes, no nothing. Mm -hmm. um, choir boy, I'm choir boy from the five heartbeats, <laughs> you know. So, but no, I was just, I was living just so fast, you know. I had my girlfriend back home, who, you know, my wife now. And, you know, I got my kid, you know, I'm like, I, you know, I need probably need to back off this thing and kind of slow it down a little bit. You know, I'd always I intended to come back at some point, but I thought I needed some time away just to kind of collect myself and, and, and slow down because I was moving mighty fast. You know, I was moving like a 20, 21 year old moves. That's as fast. And if you have nothing, there are no impediments to where I can go. You know, if I want drugs, it's all the drugs you want. You want women, it's all the women you want. Whatever you want, it's right there. You know, and you got to be able to, you got to be able to yank those reins and you kind of get out of that. You know, so I felt like I needed to be home. So, came home. And, uh, and, and, and you felt, at the end of that, you felt like you definitely made the right decision? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No doubt about it. And, uh, and in fact, that was, that was George's first retirement in 1980. Because if you remember, he didn't go out on the Glory Hall Stupid Tour. Right. And in fact, I was sitting home because I had, also in that time period, I had a kind of beef with management. You know, and so George summoned me to Detroit while with, I was off. With, with Archie or other people? No, it was Archie. 
Ar not just Archie, but Archie was part of it. Yeah. Who actually, Archie was my first roommate. I, I'm glad you mentioned that. But, you know, Mike was my, you know, was like a couple of weeks later, he was my roommate. But Archie was my very first roommate. At any rate, yeah, it was just management in general. You know, I was, in fact, speaking of in general, they used to call me general principal because I would always uh, say, man, it's the principal of the thing. That was my, that was my, that's a guaranteed line out of my mouth. That's the principal. So, but I said, I probably need to sit this one out. And, you know, George never was fully aware of what happened. He's sitting, you know, sitting in his farm. I'm sitting home. He called me up. Uh, come on up here. You know, let's let's talk. So I flew to Detroit. You know, we kind of talked. And by the end of, of our talk, he said, man, they, he was convinced, let's just say, he was convinced that he needed to come back on the road. So he did. And when he came back, I came back. Which is the amazed? next. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Are, are you amazed that, that George has still kept at it to this day? Yes. <laughs> I, I can't believe it. And to me, now it's even more. It's, he works more now than we ever worked at like the height, height of PFUNK. When PFUNK might have been the number one black group on this earth. He's working more now than we did then. It's amazing. I couldn't do it. You know, I thought yeah. Macy worked a lot. Ah. Answer this because I was there. Yeah. And uh, night. Uh, first night. Yeah. And, and um, saw you do it. You did your thing. I mean, everyone did their thing. It was an incredible lineup with all three guitar yeah. players. Yeah. And you and uh, mm -hmm. Bootsy coming out for his cameo. And, yeah. Uh, and Maceo doing the emceeing. And, yeah. Uh, man, it was loud. That was one of the loudest concerts I think I've been to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you remember that, about that experience? That was my favorite tour. Of, of, you know, that I've ever done. It was, the band was, it was a lot of people, but it seemed small. You know, everybody got along, no drama. You know, the money was the best it had been at that up to that point. Everything was smooth. It was just great. The music was great. You know, we, we brought a lot of people out. Yeah, I met Prince at that concert. You know, Prince was there. Prince and uh, maybe uh, Jesse Johnson were together. You know, uh, um, Stanley Clark, Lenny White. Um, some Gap dudes, like Raymond Calhoun, who I already knew, but he was there. And, uh, you know, a couple of the, you know, those dudes. But met met some good people. Nice, smooth tour. The routing was, like, perfect. It was just a great tour. It was well thought out and well organized. My favorite. In fact, the only bass that I have from my early career is the bass from that tour. That's it. That's the only bass that I kept. And to me, that's the one I most associate you with because I saw it. But the <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, and, I got and you got your solo something about that. You got your solo spot too in that show. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was really fast too. <laughs> Coming out of, uh, uh, I want to say, do 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 do. What is that? <laughs> Loopzilla, coming out of Loopzilla into the Skeet solo. And they left Loopzilla off this set, unfortunately. Yeah, I know. Well, I have the original. I have the, you know, the tracks from that. I have that in my personal collection. Well, it also got you back with, with uh, Dennis. Yeah. Well, he was still in the band. He hadn't left yet. So we were still together up until like after that tour. So we played from when we got in the band, maybe early 79 through 84. And he left in 85 to go with um, special effects and then on from there. 
But yeah. And then uh, a couple years later, you got credits on this, George Clinton's album. Which one is that? Some of my best jokes. I wrote something on there, I think. Uh, Thrashing, maybe? Is that on there? It, it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got the first you got the first name on that one. Yeah. That's the only song that I ever recorded that I thought about in advance. Yeah. That bass part I thought of in advance. Other than that, they were all like I came up with them right in the studio. That track to me was the most sort of traditionally P funk parliament funkadelic vibe yeah. of the whole record. Right. A lot of it was electronic, yeah. you know, or anything. Yes. In fact, Dennis played, he was playing like a Lynn drum or something with his fingers. And he went back and played actual drums along with what he played. So it's actually both drum drum parts on there. The finger stuff he did, as well as the, you know, the Dennis kick. I mean a kid he did. I just can't. I'm trying to remember if I could actually hear it. Uh, maybe the da 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 da. Maybe you can hear it on that part, but the rest is all drums you can hear. But yeah. How how would you say things were different in the studio then from when you first joined the, the Funk Mob? Well, we didn't record as much per day. It wasn't. It wasn't factory like by then, which is why I could think about a bass part. You know, I couldn't think about it before. I just had to go in there and play it and then on to the next one. Let's go, let's go. You know, but but by then, in fact, I mean, maybe two songs I recorded when thrashing, when I recorded that. And I had so much so, I went back, I, I took the roughs to the hotel with me, listened to it came back the next day and changed some of the bass parts. And you can never do that before. You know, once it was once it was there, it was there. Okay, bye. Get out of here. Go home. But then, you know, I could give it some thought, especially since I wrote it and co-produced it, though I got no credit for that. But, you know, that's, that's the way it goes. Were there any tracks that you cut that you remember uh, during, you know, that 78 to early 80s period where it was something that you were pretty psyched on but it never got released or yes or or you Absolutely. played a part and they and they mixed your part down farther than you would have liked or something like that there was a part there was a there was a song i believe Jerome Braley wrote it i can't really remember but we recorded it the same time we did Groove Allegiance. And man, that was bad. I can't remember. I had no name. It had some stupid name like Cockroach or something, you know, for, for labeling purposes. But man, it was bad. It never made it on anything. I think maybe Jerome redid it on like a Mutiny album or something later. <coughs> Excuse me. But it was, man, it was bad. But, you know, that's the way it goes. George used to say, man, I got, I probably got a, a thousand songs you recorded in the can. He could probably release albums every six months for the next 10 years of stuff I've played on that never was released. So you think that stuff has been preserved? No, probably not. It's, you know, you know, they didn't think about that kind of stuff then. Probably left it in some damp warehouse somewhere. Next thing you know, it's liquefied. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that uh, fire. But I that think he, at some point, <clears throat> right, I think at some point he tried to, uh, he had a guy out in Oakland like trying to digitize a bunch of stuff. I have some of those tracks, actually. Like a lot of the stuff that I did, I have like digital tracks of now. Like digital sessions for like Pro Tools or something. And then, uh, is it right that you came back and you were involved in this yeah. one? Yeah. Yep. So how did that happen that you kind of came back into what he was doing here? I was out of the band five years at that point. 
George called me up, and and not, not only was I out of the band, I didn't want anything to do with them. I was out. I was back home, working a regular job, you know, wearing a tie every day. <coughs> Excuse me. I was great. I was happy. I had, had no musical interest at all. None. He called me up. He said, um, yeah, I'm doing this record. Um, we're going to have everybody back. Pretty much everybody that's ever been a part of a P-Funk project. We're going to have them all back. You know, do a song or two. I think I probably ended up doing half of that record. It was supposed to be a song. But that that was one of the cases where some, some old Bootsy tracks, like Flatman and Bobbin, he took Bootsy off and I just ended up playing it. My, my interpretation of whatever it was. And there's a couple tracks like that. But he said, yeah, we're going to do this thing, you know, CBS, blah, da, 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 da. I said, okay. I, yeah, I'll come up and do it. Sure, why not? So I went to Detroit, recorded whatever I recorded. And then he said, he wrote me in. This is what he did. He said, uh, the next show is in, I, I think it's, uh, what was it? Pennsylvania University or Philadelphia University, whatever it was, or some university in, in near Philly, either in Philly or near Philly. That's the next show. Why don't you, you know, just fly with me down there, then you can go home from there because Philly, Baltimore, that's nothing. I said, okay. So I showed up at this gig. Everybody is absolutely shocked to see me, everybody. Because I, like I said, I've been out of this band for five years. You know, I played a couple songs, and then it was the same thing, just like the beginning. Yeah, why don't you, you know, come out, do a couple songs, da 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 da. I was, okay, whatever. And because I think, like, like Al Pacino says, every time I get out, they pull me back in, right. and and that's what he did from the ball phone. So I how, thought that so, record should have done better than it did. I don't know why it didn't oh, do better. Some nice stuff on there. I love this record. This to yeah. me was was the best one going back to um, right. at least Glory How Stupid. I agree. Um, <coughs> I agree. Yeah, I mean, I I know people that are not even you know diehards that really love this too. It it had that kind of. I think, you know, mass appeal, but right. somehow they, they fumbled it. Mm-hmm. I agree. <laughs> so how long were you uh, involved at, at that point then after coming back for that? Uh, until I left for good, which was 98. So from that point, I was in the band until 98. And then I left for good. Good and went with Maceo in '99, and been with him since then. So, did you leave around the same time as Greg Boyer, or did he leave after? Or? He left before me. Before you, because he was playing with Maceo when I got with Maceo. Uh -huh. He had been there. He had been there a year, I believe. <coughs> so, t tell tell us about your relationship with Maceo. How did you become close with him, and and what's he like off stage? Well, you know, as I said, in 78, he came in and subbed, you know, and we got along because, you know, he's meticulous. You know, I'm, I have a very meticulous nature, so we just got along on the basis of that. And when he had an, he called me to sub in his band, <coughs> I want to say sometime in 98, but I couldn't do it because I was, I was just starting to do stuff with Dr. Dre at that point, and I didn't want to jeopardize that. So I said, I can't, you know, I said, but, you know, give me a, enough notice, and I, I'll see if I can work it out at some point in the future. So he called me maybe three, four months after, and I just happened to be up. This is the weirdest thing. I was off. He had a two-and-a-half-week tour. And the day and which ended in San Francisco, and the day after that, P Funk was going to begin in Los Angeles. So it was like perfect, kismet, right? Mm -hmm. So I said, "Yeah, I can do that." So I went out and did it. My second show with Maceo, 
Now, gr now, mind you, this is January, right? January 1999, second show. Maceo, come here, come here, come here. So, so, so what's up, what's up? He says, you're going to finish out the rest of the year, right? So this is a two and a half week tour. Now he wants me to finish the rest of the year. This is January. So it's a whole lot of year left. So I said, I tell you what I'll do. I'll call the office, P-Funk office, and I'll see what I can work out. So I called the office and it was not pretty. It was not, it was bad, in fact. And I quit for good that day. And I said, I'm yours. I do whatever you need, I'm, I'm there to Mayfield. And as I said, I've been in the band over 20 years now. So and that's when Lige became the man for uh, P4. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how, how does how does playing in Maceo's band differ from what you've done with P-Funk? You know, how does it affect what for you do? There is no difference. Because as I said, he gives me kind of, uh, just wind, wind me up, let him go. That's kind of the same thing. Although with him, he has cues that you really need to pay attention to. From James Brown. Yeah. So, yeah, if I my foot does this, that means do that. You know, if I do this, that means one thing. If I do that, that means one thing. If I, you know, so you got to just pay attention to them because there's no, there's no script. You know, we do songs in a particular order. Song starts the same, ends the same. But in the middle, anything can happen. So you just need to pay attention. I got a couple of these here. <clears throat> yep, I'm on both, both of those. I would have to say School Zen is my favorite. Me too, because it's almost pure funk on that one. Yeah. Yeah. And there's one, let me see, Made by Maceo, School Zen. What's the other one I'm trying to remember? Roots? No, I was, that was before me. So you're going to make me look now. I got to look. <laughs> well, you did that Roots Revisited, too. I don't know. Yeah, that was before me, too. I got to look on my playlist now. Maceo. I probably, I, I might have it here. Style Maceo. That was my first Maceo record. That's, uh. 2000, yeah. Yeah. Here you go. Can you see that? Yep, got it. Yep. So, but yeah, School Zen is my favorite. So the stage is different with the cues and so forth, but what about in the studio? Any difference? Must be a little less chaos. Well, yeah, because we play live in the studio. There's no overdubs. So it's like a, it's like a gig, basically. So but only difference is you might do it four or five times. So you tell us where he wants it. But yes, all live, here we go. A lot of people I think don't realize how multi-talented Maceo is. I mean he's not a he's he's a pretty fair singer also and you know yeah. quite, a, quite a band leader of course also. Yeah, he uh he probably sings more on you know on tour. <laughs> which makes it extra special when he plays. You know, he played somewhere over the rainbow one night as an interlude and, a, and to pass the peaks. And man, it was just he, him and Will, the keyboard player. Just thing of beauty. Wow. Thing of beauty. Awesome. Um, yeah. He's, he's always been my favorite sax player. Um, yeah. And I think <coughs> my son's middle name is Parker, named after him. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of that, remember I said I was awestruck with Larry Graham? Mm -hmm. When I first met Maceo, same thing. You know, he, he and Kush over there playing, you know, doing a little P Funk horn thing. I'm playing bass. You know, I kind of looked over and I said, man, that's Maceo Parker over there. You know, this is insane. You know, like a 21-year-old kid, you know, man, this is crazy. 
Okay. Okay. Let's get a grip. All right. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. I got the coughs for some reason. So it's good for people to know that when you're doing your thing, you're not like thinking about like the grocery list or something. You're actually. Uh -oh. <laughs> no, I'm all in. I'm all in for real. It may look, I may look disinterested, uh, you know, or whatever. But I believe me, I'm I'm all in it. I hear everything. See, so if I don't have anything else, I have really good ears. You know, so if the if the guitar player changes something, the keyboard player changes something, the horns, I'm on because I'm listening. You know, I'm kind of you know, remember my skeet thing, my head's down. You know, but you know. I kind of got this one eye. I'm looking at Maceo. I look basically at his feet because I can tell what's coming based on his feet. So, you know, I got my head down, look, got the one eye on his foot, and then got the ears listening to what's going on. And, you know, I'm in it. Believe me. I'm not I'm not getting ready to fall asleep. So, so, when, so tell the people, when you see me playing, do not be confused. Yeah. I'm, 100, I'm 150% about what's going on so would you say that um how, how would you say your playing has changed in these 30 40 years i, I play less notes number one and i think probably i play more precisely now than i did i play with more purpose you know i used to play shock and awe you know, that's, man, did he do that? You know, that that was it. But now, it's, I like to hear that, too. But I kind of, you know, my playing now is placement more than, you know, overwhelming a piece. You know, I like to try to fit within it in a way that you don't really hear it. In fact, George, George paid me probably... One of the biggest compliments I ever heard from anybody. And he wasn't even talking to me. I just overheard this. Somebody was talking about somebody's triplets, some bass player playing triplets. And Joy said, he can do those. In fact, he does them every night. You just It's just not obvious. You know, you know you heard something and you liked it, but, he, you know, it's gone now. He said, what you, Skeet, you want to appreciate him. Listen to the playback. And that, to me, that's a great compliment. You know, I'm not trying to over, I'm not trying to overwhelm the piece. I'm trying to be complimentary. But, you know, I, I want to, you know, I want to be recognized too. But I don't want to try to be, I don't want to muscle my way in. You know, finesse my way in. You know, somebody that's listening to the bass will, will hear it. But the public at large won't hear it because, it, you know, it, it happens too quickly. It's dad's gone. But in the playback, it's like, wow, that's like a Josh Dunham. You know Josh? I don't. With, uh, Prince. He played with Prince. Oh, I know. Oh, Josh with Prince, yeah. Yeah, he plays something on uh, Get On The Boat. It's just one little, it's a little two-bar thing. It goes by really quick. But it's like the baddest two bars I've ever heard on a record, ever. But uh -huh. it goes by quick. Boom, it's gone. And Doug Wimbish and I, like way back, we used to talk about little two-bar things that you can slip in. You know, Doug is really good at that. You know, he got a little two-bar thing, he does it, it's gone. You know, I've always done that. You know, sometimes one bar. But yeah, you can get your thing in there, but you, you know, you don't want to... You don't want to muscle the piece. You know, it's not my band. That, which goes back to that Victor Wooten thing. You know, Victor Wooten is, you know, he can do that. That's the Victor Wooten band. There is no Rodney Skeet Curtis band. You know, I put my my sole purpose is to compliment Maceo. You know, I'm not trying to outdo him. I can't. He's Maceo Parker. I can't outdo him. You know, all those people that they paid to see him, not me. So, you know, I just do my little part, you know. If he, if he likes it, he'll turn around and, he, you know, he'll come back there and talk to me a little bit. Man, that was nice. Or, or, you know, we'll be going backstage after the gig. He's, Ski, you get the game ball tonight, you know, which is cool. I'll take that. But I don't want to be that guy, you know. 
You know, I know this is Maceo, but you listen to me. You know, I'm not I'm not that guy. Team player. Yeah, try. The locker room is more important. You know, you got to be good in the locker room. Everybody can play at this level. Everybody. You know, awesome. what it comes down to is how you get along with everybody. To me. I was watching a video on YouTube of you doing your thing. Uh, I think it's a lead in to in time. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's a real cool break. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If I had to describe your style, I would say <clears throat> very much sort of like, at least when you solo, usually like alternating between some thumb plucking kind of stuff and doing the finger stuff. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, and yeah. Almost like call and response or the, Right. Talk to yep. each other. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, got the little slappy thing going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a little cutesy, little jazzy thing. And, you know, maybe some chords, you know. So you, I got this little, I got this section right here to express myself. So, you know, depending on the audience, you know, how do I want to do this? I want to do, you know, 60, 40, jazzy, funky, you know, 90, 10. You know, you, all, you have to think about all of that. So, so. But you're right, you know, first it's a little slappy thing, then it's a fingery thing, then it's back to a slappy thing. And that seems to work. Maceo likes it, so it's, I'm all in. So, I'll ask you like a couple more questions, okay? Sure. Mm-hmm. Looking back on these 40 years, what yeah. are you most proud of? Most proud that I. I didn't derail my career when others may have. You know, things have not always been smooth. And and there have been times when I could have really freaked out and ended up digging ditches somewhere. You know what I'm saying? So I'm glad that I was able to rein my emotions in and kind of try to see the bigger picture. You know, there's more, there's more to life and the music business than than reacting to everything that doesn't go right. Because a lot of things don't go right. You know what I'm saying? And if you get bogged down in the business part of it, you can lose sight of the artistic part of it. I'm not saying ignore the business part of it because it's very important, but you can't be so controlled by it that you kind of lose sight of the reason you're there, which is your artistic prowess or whatever. You know, I'm very proud that I was able, I've been able to maintain, especially as, as I've gotten older, maintain a certain you know what I'm saying? You know, straight off the streets. You know, I was, I was a handful. Let's put it that way. But no, you know, everything's everything's good. I love everybody. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> everything's great. So I'm proud of that. And I was very proud of a few of the recordings that I've done, like Group Allegiance. You know, that's that's high on my list. And the whole Beverly Theater. You know, the two CD set. I love it. You know, probably even now I get more compliments on, especially like knee deep off of there. Even now, and, you know, I'm very proud, you know, live. Let's go. Count it off. Let's go. No overdubs. Let's go. Let's you professional musician. Let's see. It. That's that's what a live recording is about. Oh, you think you're pretty good. Let's go. One, two, three. <laughs> you know, so I'm proud of that record. But. And my bride's work and uh, Bernie Worrell work, you know, because, you know, Bernie stuff was funky, but a little jazzier, you know, and I, you know, I got to be smooth. What, what did you uh, play on all the uh, Woo in the World? I played uh, Woo Together. Um, happy, to, happy to have happiness on your side. Wait a minute. I, you're going to make me look now. <laughs> You're taxing my memory now. <laughs> Insurance Man for the Funk was on there. No, that's, uh, Bootsy. that's Bootsy. Oh, you got the titles? Okay, much, ripped the titles much, much thrust. 
No, that's uh, I think that's I think that may be Billy. I'm on Warship Tushan, Amorous, Birdie. Um Oh no, I'm on the prize. We're talking about Bernie. Let me yeah. know. But you're on Amor see. you're on Amorous and Birdie? I wrote both of those actually. Yeah, we didn't mention those. Those are two of the baddest tracks to me. Yeah, I wrote both of those. Birdie especially, the, the second half of that where it breaks down is great. Yeah, Nikki, you know Nikki Glaspie? Yeah. She loves Birdie. She, you know, that's like I think she might have that like six times on her playlist. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted okay. I wanted to hear an extended version of that, baby. Okay, here I am. Woo together. I'll be with you. Hold on. Happy to have happiness on your side. So that's one, two, three, four of the seven songs on here. And as I said, you know, Bernie had a jazzier thing, so that kind of fit with my style at the time. You know, we could we could communicate. We had a very good musical communication link, so that was that was fun. But also, yeah. so um, we got what you're most proud of. What is your one or two most unforgettable memories? Unforgettable that first gig, Checker Dome that I told you about, because I, you know, almost died my first gig. <laughs> And, and and amidst all the chaos, the brotherhood with the guys in the band. You know, even though I've been out of the band 20 years, I still talk to almost everybody, you know. And it's, it's you know, it's, I still consider them my brothers, everybody. So, yeah, that's... Yeah, that would be it. That's the, the most memorable thing. And and the Atomic Dog Tour, beginning to end. Loved it. Best tour I've ever done. And I've got to meet some interesting people along the way. Yeah. <laughs> and so what's up next? Where do you 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 gonna hit the road again in the near future? And what's what's next for um, Ski Curtis? Headed out to Seattle next monday we're doing a res residency at uh what's it called a uh, jazz alley so we'll be there four days five days whatever it is and then i come home for a minute then it'll be my birthday and i'm going back out to la to hang with my boys for a few days and uh, then the next macio thing after that i try not to look too far ahead yeah i try not to look beyond the next thing which is seattle so i i don't know what's after that I have to consult my brain that they are going over there. <laughs> so, Do you anticipate more um, U.S. gigs for a while, or do you think you can go overseas? I think so. I know we don't go back to Europe until November, so whatever happens between now and then will be in the States. And I know the next thing is in the States. And as I said, I don't know what's after that. So that works for me. Yeah. So you need to decompress. How many boys do you have? How many what? Did you say you were going to hang out when you said your boys? Oh, it's just my friends. My friends. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Just hang out with my, my boys. <laughs> yes. So I have really good friends. Like my one of my best friends, you know, he works with Dr. Dre. He's his partner, basically. So I go hang with him, you know, kind of make my way through the West Coast. Just see some good friends of mine and get back. It'll be the week after my birthday. So, and his birthday is a few days before mine. So that's kind of our annual birthday celebration, the week after our birthdays. What day is your birthday? September 7th. Okay. And, and I think we finish on the 2nd. Well, I come back home on the 2nd. My friend Larry's birthday is on the 3rd. So he'll do his celebration with his people. I'll do mine with my people. Then we do our joint thing, you know, the week after my birthday. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, what, what did you do with Dr. Dre, by the way? I have no idea. 
that would be an example of go in the studio, do something, leave the studio. You know, I, I, I can't, I couldn't, by, that, by, by the time I started doing that, I had no bandwidth left for storage. So I just go in, record, and leave. You know, I had no, no, not the one thing that I actually remember doing is something for the firm, which was, I think, Nas and this one and that one. I, you know, I, I'm an, I'm an old guy. I don't know, who, you know, I, I don't know who they were, but yeah, that's, that would be the perfect example of leave your work at the, at, at the workplace. You know, I don't remember any tracks that I did. I remember no parts because they were all pretty short. You know what I mean? And what he would end up doing is taking a part, sampling it, cutting something out of it, maybe putting something in, uh, into it, and then making something else out of it. Like I know one time, one of my bass parts ended up being a kick drum. So, you know, and so I don't know what's what. I would have to hear it to, to know. And at this point, like I said, I, I don't have the, the bandwidth to, you know, up here to, to even try to hold on to that stuff. Do you, do you feel like you've gotten enough recognition on your career? I've gotten as much, much as I've wanted. You know, in fact, Marcus Miller doesn't think so. He, you know, he, you know, he's almost offended that, you know, I'm not recognized more. I'm like, it's okay, dude, I'm good, you know. You know, I can go to the dollar store if I want to. You know, I, you know, there's some value in that. You know, to be able to walk around with your family and all that. Mar Marcus can't do that. He will be harassed somewhere. You know, Dennis can't do it. I know that because I've been with him when we were trying to go to the movies. And, it, you know, dudes, oh, 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 sign, sign, sign. We're just trying to go to the movies. You know what I'm saying? So I'm good. You know, I made three or four dollars, you know, comfortable, you know. Uh, and, and those who, 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 the people who know me are the people who I work with generally. You know, they are fans, you know, types who know who I am. But generally, it's the people I work with. And that's, I'm cool with that. You know, I got no problem. If I wanted to be more recognized, I would have made it a point. To, to seek to be more recognized. You know what I'm saying? Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But that was never important. Well, if you're comfortable with it, we're good with it because we love, <laughs> we love yeah. what, you, what you've done. Uh, thank thank you. you so much for all the fantastic so, music you've given thank us. You. Thank you for keeping the faith with the funk always. Absolutely. That's, that's my mission. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Yes, sir. <laughs> Ski, take good care, and uh, we we'll hope to see you out there soon. Drop me a line. Yep. All right. Peace. Peace. <laughs> hey, back at Truth and Rhythm headquarters. Thank you for joining us on another magical ride with Truth and Rhythm. Whether you're watching or listening, as always, thank you so much for your continued interest and support. Be sure to subscribe. Go to YouTube. Go to the Funk and Stuff channel. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives and breathes and thrives. Also, goodies here like TIR Quick Takes. And if you subscribe, you know what? You get the show before anyone else. It's free. If you love jazz, funk, R&B, soul, you can't miss it. Pass it along. Tell a friend. Tell family. This audience is growing, and it is a beautiful thing. All coming together for the love of this great music. Also, if you can throw us a buck or two, we could use the support financially, keeping the lights on, keeping the servers going, all these expenses. If you can help support the program, whatever you can give, much appreciated. Go to the funkinstuff.net website. And on the right-hand side of every page, you just click and you can donate through PayPal, credit card, whatever. Very easy to do and so much appreciated. And if you do a sizable donation, I will mention you on the program. Also, drop me a line. Email me at scottg at funkinstuff.net. Let me know who else you'd like to see on the show, what you enjoy about the music. Let's just kibitz. 
and uh, talk about stuff, you know, talk music. You'll find that I respond very quickly, and I much enjoy the uh, rapport and the camaraderie and the interaction. Always remember, this is your show, The True Music Lover. So for now, that's all the time we have for this one. It's a wrap. As always, Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.